and welcome to, well, let's call it my favourite 15 boutique Blu-ray releases this year. I feel like it did a pretty good job this year of watching what I bought. I will say in general, I have a trying to exclude any multi-box films from the top 15 releases. I might talk about those in the future, but in general, I have a terrible record of finishing box sets. Awful. I start lots of them, I really enjoy them, but actually finishing that last film doesn't always happen in it. And I mean, it's sort of by design because it gives me something to come back and revisit to in a later date. With that in mind, I've narrowed down to 15 from lots of labels right across the way. Although I will say this is very much UK focused thing. So you'll not see any releases actually this year from outside that couldn't be bought from outside the UK. So first one up, number 15 is Adoption. Adoption is from Second Run and it's a film if you've been watching the channel at all you'll have realised I've talked about before. Adoption tells the story of a woman who is going through the stage of her life where she wants a child. She is in a, an ex-marital affair at the moment. While she doesn't want that person necessarily to be the father, a long-standing father of that person around the place, she's happy just to use him in order to have a baby. And this may or may not create some, some problems. In, in, in this relationship and actually making that happen. At the same time, she gets friendly with a young woman who lives in the orphanage. And that's where the film, the grey urn, where the film uh, lives in how she treats this young woman, how she provides and cares for her emotionally, if not, you know, monetarily or otherwise, and how it changes her perception of what it would be like to be, to be a mother. And this is by Marta Mazzaros, who has received a couple of festival screenings, both in the BFI, Criterion and Janus Films seem to have licensed a lot of her films and Adoption is due to come out in the Criterion collection soon. I heartily recommend it. I, I think it's a really interesting look at alternative families and I think a lot of the Masaris films that I've seen this year deal in that area of non-traditional families and what way they, they shake out and whether they you know, merits the wrong word about what, or how they stand up and whether they can survive but again interesting for to dive into and I think adoption is terrific whether you're getting the second run release here or whether you're talking about the upcoming criterion because if you haven't seen it you really should and uh, well not the last second run release that you'll see on the list but in truth they've had such an incredible year that I could have picked 12 of theirs I've tried to narrow it down whether they're your favourites or not. At 14, we have a indicator release. Uh, an indicator, and the first of the indicator releases this year, again, number of these in the list, but this one is Things Change oh, with Don Amici and Joe Mantegna. Things Change is a, is a comic film, a comic drama, uh, which sees Don Amici's character get approached by the mob for an amount of money to take the fall for a mob member because he looks like him. He gets sent to be looked after by Joe Montaigne's character who first keeps him safe up until the trial and he decides to give this man the best or look after this man and give him a good final weekend. And there's Capers and Sue. Uh, I think the Capers and Sue and works so well mainly because Joe Montaigne plays it so straight. Don Amici does not even though his character is straight faced. I think there's real warmth and joy throughout the entire film. This film is made with love and I think it's really interesting that Don Amici was originally, you know, auditioned for one of the other roles but actually I can't imagine this film without him. So that is Things Change. Number 13, Francis Ford Coppola's The Outsiders. Now this is a 4K box. Lots of people have done unboxings of this etc. It's um, it's an absolutely gorgeous set, I really I really must say. But it's a film that really surprised me. I have, I have to say, I, I'd seen the trailer for this, kind of thought, it's for me, not for me. This kind of young gang culture is, is usually a type of film and a, and a genre that I, that I bounce on. What you have is a film about gang and young gang culture and young youths and gangs, which has an incredible cast. I mean, I mean this cast is just ridiculous. Basically, anybody who was anybody at that age is in this cast and most of them went on to be big stars. I mean, Tom Cruise is in it, Patrick Swayze is in it, Matt Dillon's in it. There's loads of people in it. It's just non-stop. If you haven't seen it before, I think half of the joy is saying, oh my God, this has got them in it as well. It pertains to be a story about gang culture and gang life, but it's a film about, about men growing up in literature and poetry and brotherhood and all of those things. And I think it would fall flat in its face if the film wasn't as 
beautiful as it is. If ever a film was appreciation of it went up by having uh, a rescan, a recolorization, and especially the colors. I mean, there's colors, and when you do the comparison between the old scan, which was not a bad scan, and this one, you just can't help but be blown away by the sunsets and the colors that they have in there. And it adds to what the beauty of this world is, and the beauty of of the struggle that these these young men had, whether they were on the, the rich side or whether they were on the poor side, it's very much a West Side story of Tale of Two Gangs kind of thing. And, and it really surprised me. And, and I will say, it probably wouldn't have made my top list if it wasn't for the fact that the restoration and, and the, the print is so beautiful. I love the extras in it as well. I love the interviews with everybody that was involved. It's a release that, it, that I really, really enjoyed. I actually rented it first of all and loved it so much that I went, oh God, I need to have that in the collection because it's such it was such a powerful film and one that that i'd like to share with other people as well as rewatch for myself and you know this is the first and not the only 4k release that i have here but there isn't that many 4k releases that made it i think it's worth saying though and especially in, in regards of this kind of box as well i think one of the really nice things about 4k that i don't hear an awful lot of people talking about is the fact that studio labels and especially studio canal give these films the boutique blu-ray treatment in 4k that they wouldn't have done so in normal blu-ray release or dvd release these things are getting you know as much care and attention and treated just the same as those other things that we love next up is the first of my criterion releases i mean criterion had just an absolute slew of incredible films some of which i've seen before some i didn't like some of the things that didn't make the list if you'd have told me you wouldn't watch them or other wouldn't make the list are unbelievable but this one is such a dip rise charolata and he also had debut out this year which i didn't quite see it's one of the one or two releases of criterion they bought this year that I didn't get watching but charolata tells the story of a young woman in a marriage without spoiling too much she has feelings for another man it's and it's that but that feeling of being trapped in a relationship that is good and is wholesome but it's not true love and it's not that next step or that the fulfillment of their life and how she feels trapped in that, how everybody in the relationship finds out about these things, these feelings that are swirling around, about the effect that it has long term. I mean, Rise filmmaking, as usual, is sumptuous to look at. It really takes you into the world and you can't help but be involved with all of these characters. I think Charlotte is a really special film uh, and one that in pure film terms is right up there with any that I've seen of his. Man wasn't a bad filmmaker, was he? Let's be honest an absolute dream of a film and really beautiful and, and just incredibly powerful next up is is a Re eureka masters of cinema release actually and again i've talked about this one previously on the channel it's the Rus russian horror film v vi whatever way you want to call it now i've talked about this at length in a previous watch list but this is another film that caught me very much by surprise it's a short film it's got a short run time and it's definitely a film that you can see influences on for many many years that came after it but being made at the time that it was the kind of visual st storytelling that is done in this film which is very much separated in two parts is kind of off the scale i mean the story of of the man who gets bewitched and then k kills the witch and then his penance for for doing that at the far end and how it comes out the young philosophers the story of the young philosopher i think is absolutely brilliant i think the disc is especially fantastic there's another film on here but even the extras and the visual essays that are on here are absolutely terrific i think this is a terrific release it was my favorite masters of cinema release this year time for another indicator release now this was a year with many great screwball comedies and it it came down to two for me but this one was more of the unknown quantity for me i mean bringing up baby came out this year i think bringing up baby is an amazing film i had so much fun with it my wife had so much fun with it but maybe because i wasn't expecting as much from it and therefore when i watched it it just took me on a real journey it's the 20th century with carol lombard and john barrymore it's ridiculously fun i mean it's the story of a producer director who gives the chance to a young woman to come into a play. She becomes a big star. In fact, her star ascends beyond his to the point that she wants to leave him and go make her own way. And he thinks, fine, I'll just get another star, but things don't quite happen nicely for him. And through a chance meeting on a train, they try and get the band back together. And it's just fun. In many screwball comedy tropes and ways it plays and all of those a will they won't they manipulate and goes on you know 
it's just great fun and, and I think the two main performances of John Barrymore and Carol Lombard actually edge this a bit over Kai Grant and Catherine Hepburn for me for screwball comedy over the year but that's not to say they're not both incredible and both amazing and actually bringing up BB probably would have made my list I just don't know what I would have knocked out of it but I've got that many Criterion releases in here that I just felt that I could exclude it and include 20th Century well I think less people have probably seen 20th Century and it's maybe less celebrated but for no good reason in my mind it's absolutely terrific and well worth checking out next one up is another 4k release and a challenging one uh, this is a film that I've seen a couple of times now and every time that I watch it it grows a little bit in, in my mind it's a horror film a film that I'm not very much known for enjoying or being sitting very comfortable with but it's something that as you can see it's not the only horror one on my in my list this is the Babadook from Second Sight uh, again another ridiculously beautiful release this is, was a real uncomfortable watch for me there's no doubt about it I, I struggled through parts of it behind my hands in some ways it was it was uncomfortable in the pit of my stomach. It tells a story of a, of a young single mother trying to deal with a difficult son uh, who is convinced that there's monsters under the bed. In fact, he wants to be read scary stories all, all night, every night, and live in that world and revel in that world. And he's convinced that the monsters are real. The mum's not convinced the monsters are real. But as time goes on, the monster becomes more real for her. Uh, and it manifests in her life and takes over life and it's really a parallel like a lot of great horror filmmaking and, and filmmaking of this sort that looks at difficulties of life and how our own mental trauma manifests itself out in other ways and while it's playful in this sense it's no less debilitating than scary and actually the resolution of it is one of the things that actually think makes it stick so far up my list because it's not just straightforward as defeating the monster and burying it etc life just isn't quite like that and it was really fascinating watching the interviews etc with the with the cast the brunette and how they treated the young man so that he wasn't too scared within this I, I thought it was really fascinating to hear that they were they were worried that the jennifer kent's film wasn't actually scary until they went to see the screenings of it and realized oh my god people are terrified and it's a real you know this was a year with both that and the nightingale and the nightingale i absolutely loved as well it's also very difficult to watch and and go through you've got the the other short film and that was the basis for the babadook also on the on the release and i think that's really interesting to watch as well and see how that story evolved in the feature uh, i just wow what, what what a release what a film Next up, I will release, and again, another real surprise. There's been lots of Asian cinema released over the past year, uh, a lot of kung fu stuff, but this one falls inside of the more modern Asian films. And this is Choi Hark's Time and Tide. And Time and Tide is bananas. It's absolutely bonkers. It starts with a barman picking up a, a cop, a lesbian cop, and getting her pregnant. Doesn't even play that much in the film, other than it gives a connection between two characters who butt heads and bump into each other quite a lot throughout the rest of the film they have a connection as the young boy tries to do the right thing for the child that he's fathered um, and the other person the cop doesn't want to have anything to do with him because she's in his life and on the side of this he becomes a guard or a hitman and he gets caught up in that world as well and there's lots of elaborate and exciting action scenes as he hooks up and gets friendly with another hitman bodyguard type person and the action set pieces are just incredibly good fun. I think it's a real rollicking good time, if you want to say that from start to finish. And and when I finished it, I just kind of had this feeling of, and this is a film I should have heard about. This is a film that I think, even amongst all of these ones, I mean, Wild Search and, and Fair Alert were also very good this year. I think all three of those releases were, were well worth checking out. But there's something about Time and Tide that I think is, that elevates it. Uh, and I think it's, it's bizarreness and it's, it's kind of out there and I think a lot of people will really revel in that fun time in much the ways a lot of people like horror movies and slasher movies for that that idea of escapism I think Time and Tide is that for this genre as well just terrific release and uh, one that I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed hence why it's so far up my list 
Next up is another Criterion release, and again, another one that I was not expecting. And I think a lot of these that are coming up here are very much films that I wasn't expecting to be this high, and they're surprises more than anything else. This is Company, the original cast recording of the album of the musical Company. And it's a kind of nothing film documentary. It basically, D.A. Pennebaker, the well-known musical documentarian, takes his camera and goes into the studio where they record over the space of a couple of days the recording of the cast recording of the musical company. Now, company is not a musical that I'm familiar with. I mean, I love musical theatre, but actually there's no musical theatre in here in what seems at the outset, although these are theatrical people, so theatrical things happen. But you get to see an insight into, you know, some incredible people working in that in that area. I mean, Stephen Sondheim is, is in this as he tries to you know, make sure that what is recaptured in the recording is what he envisaged and what he wrote and that it hasn't been changed by the performers over time. And there's there's lots of, of ups and downs of the recording of people going, that wasn't good enough, we need to try again. They've got limited space to record it in. But it ultimately culminates with like this amazing meltdown and it's in a brilliant, brilliant documentary. I, I, I absolutely adored it. I've watched it multiple times. It's not very long. The extras on it are also... Great, there is a spoof, like Saturday Night Live thing where they they do it with a different cast. Some of the original people are in there, but they, they, they record it. It's just brilliant from start to finish. I think if you've watched the film, you'll get an awful lot out of, out of that. And I'll talk about, you know, the fact that the people that were involved. I mean, Sondheim sadly passed away this year. as a great loss to musical theatre. Um, he wasn't, he was obviously, you know, he was featured in Tick, Tick, Boom as well, which I also thoroughly enjoyed this year, although... Not in the list because it didn't receive a physical release this year. But uh, maybe it's coming to Criterion in the future. I look forward to that. But I think Companies is well worth checking out. And one that I think a lot of people will miss. Next up is my one and only from this label. Now I've seen a lot of this labels I put this year. It's BFI. And I've enjoyed all of it. And picked just about everything up that they've released this year. I really enjoyed it. But mm, only a couple of things elevated itself to make on this list you know it would have sat a lot of it sitting just below that and a couple I haven't quite seen yet so I haven't quite seen um, Out of the Blue yet which was one of their real banner releases I did talk about one of my aircraft is missing but another one I talked about earlier on the year that I think is just one of the greatest films that I've seen this year is After Love and after love it's just the story of a woman who loses her husband at the start and while tidying up his affairs comes to find out that maybe she did not know him as well as she thought she knew there's just poignancy drama and just some of the most incredibly moving and deep performances joanna scanlon in the film is utterly insanely good and it's just i i think it's a very special british independent movie um and one that I think every, I'll just keep on recommending to people because I think it's moving in ways that, that not a lot of other films are on that level. Like another film that was released this year that I think goes for that but doesn't quite hit that level. Something like Limbo, if you've seen Ben Sharrock's Limbo, that came out in movie this year and got a physical release as well. Uh, I think it's terrific. Um, it doesn't quite hit the emotional depths and heart of. After Love, but again, terrific as well, and one that I heartily, heartily recommend. Next up is a uh, Idiot Films release, and again, I picked up a lot of Idiot Films release this year, and this is one that I bought initially, didn't watch for a while, because there was a lot of that kind of stuff coming out at the moment, is The Young Master, the Jackie Chan. It is a special edition that they made, and I, and I kind of thought to myself when it came out, because it was the first of these that Idiot Films did, is why have they went to town on The Young Master when other ones they haven't done? with this hard box, uh, etc. The only difference seemed to be that there was multiple cuts of the film coming out. And the reason they went to town on it is I think Young Master is a really good film. It's, it's a kung fu movie that deviates from the norm of story that a lot of them fall into, of the hero's journey, of the young unknown boy that is the but of everybody's joke and then rises to be the top, which is not what the young master is, although there is that kind of journey that goes along. It tells the story of competing tribes or competing schools. Uh, the dragon fight scene at the start is it's utterly brilliant for a start. All the set pieces are terrific and from start to finish. And and you know, Jackie Chan I think is great in it, but he's got a great supporting cast of, of both heroes and villains as these things normally do. I think I, I think it was a standout of a lot of the Kung Fu stuff that I've seen this year and I watched a lot of it. Um 
and this release especially I know a lot of releases go into the differences between cuts but I think this did a better job than most of explaining actually not what the differences were but why the differences were what they were uh, for instance the uses of different soundtracks and the reasoning behind different soundtracks maybe I just missed it from other releases and what they talk about but the fact that the American releases Japanese releases have extremely different soundtracks in them and why you know the appeal to a different market why they, they went in that direction uh, there's just so much on this that it's, that it's it's hard to fathom that this was a whole Sunday for me one day. I devoured it from start to finish, looked at the, the essays and, and then the book, the story of Jackie's life and career, etc. in here. It's just oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful release. And a really stacked one with the multiple discs inside as well. It was my favourite Kung Fu movie that I've seen this year. Like I say, I've seen a lot of them. There are a lot of great ones. The only other one that really comes close, I think, is, um, is King Boxer uh, from the Shaw Scoop set which again, told you, was excluding uh, box sets. Uh, but I think as a Kung Fu movie, that was, that was the one that came closest. We're in the top four now, and we're on to Indicator again. And again, I'm going, this is a film that is in a genre that I normally shy away from. It's a light sleeper, and it's a Paul Schrader film, Mr. Stan Willem Dafoe and Susan Sarandon. And it tells the story of a man who deals in drugs, but the high class clients. Um, and he's trying to get away from that life and he reconnects with an old girlfriend uh, somebody that he would like to get in touch with again and, and it kind of spurs him on to want again to get out of this game especially Susan Sarandon seems to be wanting to get out of it as well and they have a friendship and relationship that that sits outside of what the drugs trade is and, 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 and their work and I thought Light Sleeper was amazing I mean Paul Schrader's a writer that I, that I like a lot. Even his misses are still hits for me. This is my favourite Paul Schrader film. Um, and more so than the films he's wrote like Taxi Driver and stuff. Uh, there's just something, that, there's a real heart that comes out from Willem Dafoe's portrayal in this that, that I think transcends in an awful lot of other ones. I mean, something like First Reformed that sits in Ethan Hawke goes for a similar kind of thing of this this man's individual journey. Uh, but First Reformed is, is colder to me. I mean, there's... There's not as much hope, I think, in that one. Uh, Light Sleeper, I think, really has hope. And I think for a year in which, you know, everybody's been looking for a bit of hope, it's a film that really resonated with me. It's a film that I think really stood out this year and one that I will watch again and again and again. I think Light Sleeper is terrific. Number three. What's well, the second run release? And maybe not the second run release that everybody's expecting. I mean, like I say, they've had such a banner year, I think, went from strength to strength. This one is a film called Mayak, or Maria Sakian's The Lighthouse, like I say, also called Mayak. And it's a film that I haven't talked about very much because I don't really know how to sell this other than, say, go watch it. It's the sort of greatest hits of a lot of Russian cinema that you've seen before. It tells the story of this young woman who has moved to Moscow after moving away from, from her, her village uh, to find life. And, and, you know, the village that, she's, that she grew up in with her grandparents is on the edge of a, of a civil war border and she wants to go back and get her grandparents and take them away to bring them to Moscow so that they are safe and they can you know revel in the more modern lifestyle that she has but it's only when getting there it becomes quite clear that her ability to leave at that time has been taken off the trains that she arrived on are no longer running and she's stuck there and it makes her value it actually the life that she had that she left behind that she thought was better and actually all the idiosyncrasies of all the people and characters that lived there. And maybe she realises that it all wasn't her memory purported it to be. Is she rescuing people from this or is she taking them to another kind of hell in its own right? There's some wonderful scenes in here. Like the, the woman who is worried about people coming, the woman who's worried about people coming to rob her. So she thinks if she take, busts out and takes out all the windows and house people, I think there's nothing to steal and she somehow thinks that that's better. But like I say, there's there's a sort of like greatest hits of British cinema in here. It's very reminiscent of Stalker in the changing colour palettes that are, that are used and the beauty of which it's shot. It's stunning to look at. There's a bleakness of like an ascent or come and see and something like that. And then there's there's like the film work and camera work of something like, you know, Cranes of Land, you know, kind of swooping in and out and how they, they traverse and see what's around. I think it's an utterly gorgeous film. I haven't heard anybody talking about it. I think it's incredible. 
I might be by myself. It's one of those, if somebody else wants to watch it, let me know if I'm going nuts or whether this is one of these films that if and when it ever gets a criterion release, people will be talking about, oh my God, have you seen The Lighthouse? It's amazing. I think it's amazing. And I'm recommending it to you. So you think it might be too. Down to number two. Number two is a, what's well, a criterion release? And again, another film that I did not see coming. And I'm going to diversify a little bit. I'll probably do... This will be one of these films that I do a longer form video about a few years down the line when it, when it kind of makes sense of an awful lot of it. But when you put on a film and you're watching it and you see and identify people that you love in that film, it makes you wide-eyed with amazement. Especially when those people are of a different race or a different colour or some different culture. And yet somehow you see them as clearly as anybody that you've ever seen. It is the film Prior by Dee Rees. And it tells the story of a young, a young woman who is again trying to find her way. She comes from a very Christian background. Her mother's devotedly Christian. Her father is as well. But he seems to have his own issues that he's trying to work through. And she has her own issues, this young woman. It's very much an autobiographical story. Uh, of Dee Rees herself as she tried to I think to explain about her own evolution as finding herself as a gay woman and how she struggled with that but actually in this context how everybody has their own problems and their own secrets and the power of the filmmaking in this it just blew me away and I think it's because I identified so strongly with some of the characters that are in here on, on all sides I could see how the realities of those conversations would have happened, how they were difficult and how they ultimately ended in the way that they did. It's just heartbreaking film and you know I've seen a lot of criticism of of Criterion for stepping so far into black filmmaking and representation that way of oh my god there's too many of these releases here. I have loved them all. They have let me see windows in the cultures and in people that were both different but that also were incredibly familiar and diversification and representation is one of the real joys of watching and being a film fan and the more for it. I mean I could have put deep cover in here as well but Bill Duke I thought it was brilliant. I've got the Mario Van Peebles box. Mario. Melvin Van Peebles box set. I suppose Mario was on it as well in places, but I haven't been able to delve into that yet. Like I said, we're not talking about box sets. But um, but prior, I, there's just something very special about this film for me and one that, that I hold very dear from this year and the one that, one that I'll treasure. And my number one is, well, it's another one of those horror films. And again, it's a film I've talked about previously and it's a film that I found very difficult to watch uh, for long parts of it but I haven't been able to stop thinking about it and that film is Raw uh, by Julia DeCarno and I haven't even seen Titan yet because I mean frankly my wife won't go and see it with me and I'll have to wait for some sort of home release for it but Raw tells a story of a young lady who's going through that change of life that growing up she's going to veterinary college a college that her sister currently resides at and she's trying to find herself, she's grown up, she's trying to find her space in the world. And as part of finding herself, she finds that she has a bit of a taste for human flesh. Now that of its own right will turn an awful lot of people off. But as classically goes, that's not really what the film's about. There's certainly aspects of there that are there to catch your attention, but they're there also to capture your imagination and actually get you to think and empathise with the character that you've got in front of you of how is she feeling, how does this horror because she's horrified at herself. How does it envelop and touch her? And what does that ultimately lead to at the far end? I think Raw is amazing. I, I, I couldn't help but be bowled over by the filmmaking. Just how powerful it was. All the little bits of the things that people do and the reasons why they do them. I thought just tremendous from start to finish. Uh, uh, one that I'd take away from this this year and second sight another release that that have really made me step outside my comfort zone this year uh, and pick up i had picked up one to start off with but also came from watching nightingale i got it to review it's not something i ever would have watched if i had rented it or started to watch it i'd have turned it off but because i had to review it i forced myself to go through it and i really got something out of that as well and 
you know, watching films that take you out of your comfort zone has been a real revelation for me this year and made me persevere with things and watch things that, especially through the conclusion, to see what the filmmaker's intention was because I'm sure there are people who take lots of different things from Raw and all of them incredibly valid because that's what art's about. It's about emoting from the creator side but also about what you as a person watching it takes from it. And those are my 15 releases for this year. I could have picked many, 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 many others. Uh, there's no Arrow releases here this year, mainly because a lot of my favourite releases from Arrow were box sets this year. The 4Ks were kind of retreaded, like Donnie Darko, Battle Royale. They weren't first time watches, so didn't have the same impact for me. Of the first time watches, the things that came close were the Masamura stuff but didn't quite hit as hard as some of this stuff. So let me know if you've seen any of these, especially, you know, I haven't tried to be different. I've just tried to pick the films that impacted me the most. And the more obscure the film, the more that I take ownership of that voyage of discovery. And it also makes it easier to recommend to you as well, because again, if you haven't seen it, then all the more exciting. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. I hope 2021 was a great year in film for yourself. Again, let me know some of your favourites that people aren't talking about down below. And I'll see you again soon. Take care. All the best. Bye.